So everybody, welcome back. This is the last video of 2017. Um, we're watching a video tomorrow in class. I'm not going to have to you know, say a whole lot for that. But if you are here, you get to watch the video um, in class about uh, a guy by the name of Jim Braddock, who was a boxer during the Depression, um, kind of fought his way back. His family kind of lived on nothing for a long time, um, and he kind of had to work his way back to it. But the video is very good. You'll see kind of what I'm talking about. However, today's question is going to look at the changes that needed to be made from Hoover to FDR. You just see some of their campaign buttons. But our bell ringing today looks at the idea of elections. When we look at elections, what are, or why are they important in determining public policy? Uh, meaning that if you have an election, what is it saying to these politicians? So these are two different questions that kind of ask the same thing. But you know, obviously, public policy is going to be determined. And, and, and I want you to think about this answer. And don't think about public policy, but think about if you're a political candidate running for an office, doesn't matter if it's state, local, federal government, whatever, and you win an election by a huge margin, what is that telling you? Let's say you win that election by a close margin. What is that telling you? And let's say you lose the election. What does that tell you? All right? There's, there's something to be learned from each of the results of those elections. You know, if you lose close or if you lose big, you know, whatever it may be, you're going to have um, some things to think about, uh, or whether you win or you, whether you lose. Um, it just depends on how much you win or how much you lose is at the same time. So think about this. Why is it important for politicians to get this down? All right. Um, after the bell, when we kind of move on, we had a note sheet yesterday. If you weren't here yesterday, download that on my Canvas page. Um, you can take a look at that as well. Um, but we also have a um, topic to cover before we move forward here with uh, the videos for the day. Um, but um, we talk about the bonus army. This is a social end. Now, we talked about how Herbert Hoover yesterday financially tried to get the, get the economy engineered back to health as much as he possibly could. He wasn't a man that believed in big government in interaction with the, with the economy to get, you know, fix people's problems. All right. Um, this wasn't exactly what he wanted to do. So, um, as some of his problems go out and they, they work, some of them don't work, and, 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 and the, the temporary um, solutions of these problems really fades away and, and there's no permanent you know, change. The Depression made Americans very desperate, which, which we all look at. However, World War I veterans hurt the most at this time period because, again, they served in the war, they come back from war, they work these labor jobs because they're only trained to be in the military, and there's not much work for them specifically for their skills. So they work labor jobs, and these are the jobs that are first cut when the depressions. When the, these are the jobs that are first cut when the depression begins. <coughs> Excuse me, businesses um, really do their best to um, lay off as many people to kind of save money that way. World War One veterans are hurt the most; they're fired. Many World War One veterans know that by 1945, pension payments are planned um, for them to get a bonus. Essentially, they call them the bonus, um, uh, the World War One bonus. Um, that's many soldiers were supposed to get, and they weren't supposed to get that until 1945. We're in 1932. We are 13 years away from getting that bonus. The problem is many World War I vets see the problems of the Depression, and they know that they get this bonus, and they say, you know what, Mr. President, we think we deserve this now. We fought in the war. We want this money. We want it now. And, and But when they go to Capitol Hill, when they go to the Supreme Court, when they go to the, when they go to, uh, the White House, they are immediately denied these payments. They want the payments now, but they are immediately denied because the money is just not there. The government cannot afford it. All right. So Hoover um, notices that when they show up and they're denied, they don't go home. They actually create encampments in Washington, D.C., where they pretty much stick around until they get what they want. And the goal was for them to stay until bonuses were given. Well, Hoover can't have that, you know, around Washington, D.C., around the Capitol building. So he orders just a very general order, um, very bland and very, very, um, uh, non-specific order to General MacArthur, who's in charge of the Army at this point. Um, he orders the, uh, General MacArthur to clear away these, um, these protesters, these bonus marchers, what they're called, the bonus army. All right. He just tells them, clear them out. You know, get them out, have them go home, and they can be on their way. General MacArthur exceeds his orders by doing one step further. That's not just clearing them out. He actually lights fire to a lot of these encampments. So a lot of these people that are sitting there waiting for these payments that are going to wait until 1945 if they have to, um, they are not um, they are not removed peace of, peaceably. They are removed with force. Um, MacArthur burns a lot of these, these shanty towns that they build near Capitol Hill um, down. And most people blame Hoover, saying that Hoover ordered MacArthur to burn down these houses, which wasn't the case. But again, politics, when, when people that are below you act in their own interests, sometimes those interests come back to haunt you because 
they're, it seems like they're acting out of your own favor. So this socially really hurts Hoover here. And in fact, many people believe that as the campaign kind of dwindles onward, um, FDR really thinks that he's just got the election won, and he did. So when we look at the election results here, um, Roosevelt wins the election by promising a new deal for Americans to help him through the Depression. And what Roosevelt really provides is not a, a list, a huge list of experiences, um, and a huge list of accomplishment, but he brings a charm. You can look at the smile here in the picture on the screen, and you can see how you know people just really fell in love with his charm. Not with what he accomplished, but what he was going to say, what he planned on doing, and how the American people were going to you know benefit from that. So, but FDR had a great way of, of speaking with the word of mouth, um, giving speeches to the American people. People love listening to his speeches, and they felt when they, he was talking. Many people felt that he was talking to them, like they had been best friends for 20 years. And that's a really difficult st skill to hone in, to relate to people, relate to their situation, and then also at the same time do your best to make sure that you can get people to vote for you in what you're saying. Um, he did a very good job of, of getting people to buy into these issues. Um, whether he was going to do them or not it didn't really matter. People saw FDR as a, an aura of hope. That if I'm not getting a job today, if I'm not getting a job tomorrow, if I'm, I'm starving today, I'm starving tomorrow, you know, <clears throat> at least in the future, whether it's near or whether it's far, it will get better with FDR. All right. And when the election results come out, it is a clear landslide when we look at the states here. Obviously, Pennsylvania, Maine, um, Vermont, New Hampshire, uh, Connecticut, uh, even Delaware uh, voted all in favor of um, Hoover, which he only gets six states. Um, the rest of the states do vote for President Hoover, I mean President Roosevelt, excuse me, um, and he wins the election. You can see the electoral vote down there at the bottom, and the popular vote was a huge margin of victory, which was, I believe, like seven, eight million people, um, which is a, a big margin at this time. So, um, a landslide victory for FDR, he wins, and, and based on our election results, he gets the, 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 pretty much the ability to do whatever he wants to, and the people will be okay with it, because he wins with these huge margins, all right? So something to think about here. These election results. Um, we also watch a video at the end of class today, and we also get a study guide. So you go to my Canvas page, and there are two videos here, Hoover versus Roosevelt, and also the presidents. This is the one we watch with the video sheet. You don't need to download that. I, I'm not going to have that you know, done for you if you're not here. I'll just make you excused. Um, but um, you can watch my YouTube video today, which is the one I'm making right now. But also, um, at the very top of this, I handed out a depression test study guide. All right? um, you're going to have the entire break to work on this. This study guide and the test will be administered on January 5th, which I believe is the Friday. We return, look like here, December, January, yep, so, no, January 5th is when the test is going to be, all right? So if you want to download that, I have copies here, but if you haven't been able to get it, please make it sure you download that copy, all right? Um, if you have any questions, please email me, let me know what you missed, all right? Or if let me know what, what you need to get caught up or what you don't understand. I'd love to help you out. Have a fantastic break and have a fantastic Holiday, everybody. See ya.